This week at church, Pastor Robin McKinley finishes his series in James with Waiting Faith. You see, the farmer tills, he sows, he toils, and he harvests with the spirit of patient expectancy. You can join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for free coffee, free baked goods, a worship service, and a sermon to follow. The church is located by the Coventry Mall on Laurelwood Road. For the last 12 weeks, we have been looking at the book of James. Today, we are going to finish up with James. We're going to be looking at James chapter 5, starting with verse 7. And we're going to go to the end of the chapter. So, we've come to see through this book that the authentic faith that we should have in our lives is God-centered and is refined in times of testing. While artificial faith is self-centered and instead of being refined in times of testing, it crumbles in times of testing. Having made his point, James concludes his faith uh, epistle with, One final encouragement. So in finalizing his letter, he offers us these five things in this encouragement, and that's what we're going to look at today. So I'm starting with your notes very early. The first one is, be prepared for the Lord's return. Be prepared for the Lord's return. Anticipation is a word that would fit in here. Do you remember back years ago, the Heinz ketchup commercials, where the little kid's waiting for the ketchup to come out, and while he's waiting, the song Anticipation is playing in the background? The message was simple. The best things in life are worth waiting for. And James says, Christ's return is probably the best thing in life. And it's worth not only waiting for, it's worth living for. So the scripture tells us in James 5, 7, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. Now the word coming here is an important end of time term. It means more than just a coming. It conveys the idea of God's presence or arrival it's a pre- Jesus bodily return Jesus has promised that one day he will return for his people to redeem them and to establish his kingdom the idea is that by living in the hope of Christ's return believers are uh, will lead godly lives that won't be uh, anything that uh, Jesus or other Christians or we ourselves will be ashamed upon when he comes again. You see, it doesn't matter if you're mid-trib, pre-trib, post-trib, or pan-trib. You don't know what pan-trib is? That's it's all going to pan out at the end, okay? (laughs) He's coming And he's coming soon. He could come at any moment. There could be this great big cloud right now above the eastern gate in Jerusalem. And that could be the cloud that Jesus... Now we might not be able to see it from this part of the world, but let me tell you something. We'll hear the trumpet sound of God. We'll hear the voice of the archangel. Yeah. And just like that, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be gone. I don't know what an eye twinkle is, but I know it's fast. So what preparations must be made for Christ's return? Some people think the only preparation is to have received Christ as your Savior. That's it. Don't have to do anything else. And that would be partially correct. Well, it's the most essential issue with the regard to eternity, but God also expects his people to live each day in anticipation. Remember, we talked about 
faith, you don't work to get your faith, but your faith produces works. So if you ain't doing anything for God, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Fortunately, God's God and not me. Because uh, I don't know where that line is. But I think it's best that we accept him and allow our faith to do things for him. So, <clears throat> how are you living? How's life for you and Jesus right now? You know, most people live for the moment, don't they? Stash away stuff that will have no place in the economy of eternity. Obtaining the whole world but forfeiting their souls. You know, if Jesus returned this moment, what would he say to you? Would he say to you, well done, or how dumb? Think about that. Would he say, well done, or how dumb? The king is coming, friends. For you, is he coming to be your king, or is he coming to be your judge? Well, the whole story that we're looking at here, well, half of it, 7 through 11 says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have been persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So James is telling us, be patient. Be patient with people and circumstances. You know, most of us aren't born with patience. Now, you might say you're a pretty patient person, but go by the nursery sometime, as sweet as those babies are, and when they're ready to be eat or they need to be changed, let's see how patient they really are. We weren't born with patience, friends. It's something that we had to acquire. And I, I, I'll confess that I'll drop my wife off at the store. She'll go in to pick up one thing <laughs> that I'm told. And I go out in the parking lot and I sit there and I sit there and I sit there and I wonder, are they baking that bread? Did they, <laughs> is she getting Italian bread and they're importing it from Italy or? And I start to get a little impatient. Now, that was my choice to sit in the car. I could have gone in the store with her and known why it was taking her so long. Now, the reason she usually uses is that there was a long line. And I'll, I'll give her that, okay? I'll give her that long line. Even though the two other cashiers weren't doing no, it. Just... <laughs> uh, sometimes just get just a little impatient. But the word patience... Patient here means long-fused to anger or long-tempered. So I've learned that even though my attitude is still in my head, I just don't say anything. It isn't worth it. I've, I've, I've won half the battle, okay? Half the battle is I won't pick a fight with my wife when she gets in because it's probably not her fault. There are times, though, she'll find someone in there to talk to. And she'll confess to that later. But uh, patience, the word emphasizes patience with people rather than patience with circumstances. So we're to be patient with all people, okay? Especially those in the church. That's what James is telling us. Talks about brothers and sisters. So we are to be patient. Now, don't mistake patience for tolerance. 
You know, we're to love the sinner, but we're not allowed to, uh, we're not um, to allow the sin to run rampant and hinder the mission of God among his people. So, you know, we, we, we're not here to tolerate the sin. The Bible says that maybe there are times we should point out the sin, but we are to be patient with the person. In fact, there, there are scriptures that say that we should be patient in bringing the person to Jesus or be patient in bringing the person back to Jesus. Or Galatians tells us to be gentle in doing that. So James gives us three examples. He gives us the farmer, the prophet, and Job. The farmer. You know, we, we were in a meeting the other morning, and the gambling came up in Pennsylvania, and I don't know why it came up in Pennsylvania, but, um, but we were talking about this, and one of the guys who is a farmer says, well, don't you know that farming is really legalized gambling? Well, you know, we never thought about it that way. You throw the seed out, and it's a gamble. Is it going to come up or not come up? <laughs> but James uses the term farmer, and what's he telling us? Keep working. Keep going. See, we learn from the farmer that patience is expectant, it's, it's established, and it's energetic. You see, the farmer tills, he sows, he toils, and he harvests with the spirit of patient expectancy. Patient doesn't mean just to sit on your hands and do nothing. It means to be actively engaged in the process of the harvest, understanding that ultimately it all comes down to the providence of God. It's living responsibly by faith. And then the prophets. What's James telling us here? He says, keep sharing. When you consider the task of the prophet, the Old Testament prophet, he was called to be a lonely, uh, called to a lonely and difficult task. You see, I think of Jeremiah who wept because nobody would listen to him. He was a voice of one calling out in the wilderness, yet he was faithful to continue sharing the message, waiting patiently for the Lord to pierce the hearts of the men he was talking to. And then we've got Job. Keep trusting. Keep trusting. The plight of Job is a case study on patiently trusting and depending on God when things just don't make sense. Few people in history have been sifted as Job was. And yet he was faithful to patiently wait upon the Lord. Here's what Paul tells us in Galatians. He says, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we uh, do not grow weary. James gives us two encouragements. He says we need to live persistently and live positively. Be persistent by standing firm. The word standing firm means to strengthen, establish, or make fast. It's a word that means to draw a line in the sand. James encourages all believers to prop themselves up with the hope of Christ's return. And as they face difficult people and difficult challenges of life, they will have that prop of Jesus and his return. He says we're not simply to say, let go and let God. I mean, that would be reckless. And I've heard people say that, but just let go and let God. Well, it sounds nice. And we're not to swing the pendulum to the other extreme and be so legalistic that we're more heavenly minded than we are earthly good. No. We're to do what God has called us to do. Knowing all the while that the results absolutely depend on God. And then he goes on to say, positive. We need to be positive people. I don't mean positive confession. I mean positive by not grumbling. Yeah. The word grumble here is to groan, mutter, murmur, to negatively criticize. It is hard to be a church on fire for the Lord if you've got a lot of grumbling going on. 
You know what grumbling is? It's like wet rags, wet blankets. And as we wait on the Lord's return, and we've got half the congregation, I'm not saying this congregation, I'm not even saying any of you. Not, no, we're on fire for the Lord. How many here is on fire for the Lord? How many is not on fire for the Lord? Look at that, it's unanimous. <laughs> There's no wet blankets here. But I do want you to know, the more you grumble, the wetter the blanket. That's just in case you didn't vote. Yeah. See, we strive to seek God's will as we wait for the return of Jesus. We strive to live within the righteousness of God as we wait for Christ's return. Because that's the blessed hope that's within us. And then as we move on, Verse 12 says, Above all, my brothers, do not swear by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, or you will be condemned. Woo! Be precise in your dreams, is what he's telling us, in your decisions, I'm sorry. Be precise, and, because until the Lord comes, we need to live with integrity. Lost men and women by nature are liars and manipulators. Believers, the scripture tells us, says let your yes be yes and your no be no. So technically, we don't have to put our hand on the Bible and say, yep, I'm swearing by the Bible. We don't have to go to our mother's grave and say, I'm swearing by my mom's grave. No, the scripture says, if you're going to say something, make it the truth. Live in integrity. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. You see, the word swear here isn't a reference to crude or unwholesome language, but to making promises invoking God's name. You see, the Old Testament oath, the Jews had a system of swearing oaths as a means of binding agreements. I mean, if, if you stop to think about it, the one where Boaz gets Ruth to be his wife. He meets with the leaders of the city at the city gate. And, and what did they, what was their symbol of an oath? It was a sandal. They took off a shoe. Here, all right, deal's made. So by taking an oath, the person was proclaiming on God's name, this is the uh, Old Testament law now, what they said was true. Only in James' time now, this was being overused. It was being abused. Believers were flippantly misusing oaths to mislead others to accomplish their will. Well, let's continue on. Verse 13 says, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone sick? Is any one of you sick? He should call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the prayer, uh, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that uh, you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Do you know what I just read right there? I just read revival. Man, that is revival right there. That's touching God and God touching us and who knows what would happen. Hallelujah. We're going to do that at the end of the service. You see, the point that we want to make here is be prayerful at all times. Be prayerful in all times. Most people believe it Yet if you really practice it, Paul calls believers to pray without ceasing. You know, one of the best ways to ruin a meeting is say, well, all right, we're calling this into a prayer meeting now. It's like a cartoon commercial. We're all gone. I don't understand that. Maybe someday I will. I don't know. You see, we must be in a constant state of God, conscious 
consciousness and communication with him all the time. That's what Paul tells us. Pray without ceasing. Here James challenges us to be prayerful in times of affliction, in times of joy, in times of sickness. He says until Christ returns, there are three aspects of prayer that we need to, to exercise. We need to exercise petition. Pray for yourself when you're in trouble. That's what the scripture says. You're in trouble, get some prayer. It says pray for yourself in, uh, in the form of praise. Celebrate God when times are good. And the scripture says pray for one another. Have others pray for you when you're sick. Now there are four reasons of sickness which should drive us to prayer. Sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. God working to mature us, to force us to depend on him. God giving us a cross to carry for him. We need to take it to the Lord. Living in a sinful world. Living in a sinful world full of sickness. So, what are your responsibilities? What should you be doing? You must ask for prayer. It's that simple. Just ask for prayer. For some reason, we've got this pride thing that we either don't want to go to God or we don't want to go to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we don't want to ask for prayer. You must confess your sins. Who do you confess your sins to? Well, there are some people you do need to confess your sins to. There's God you need to confess your sins to. We're not going to set up a confessional booth here, friends. We don't really care what your sins are. We just want you to be forgiven. And you must seek righteousness. Very important. What is righteousness? Just doing the right thing in the eyes of God. That's simple. Well, he says, my brothers, one of you, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. Be passionate for the souls of men. Be passionate for the souls of men. This is James' final command. We must patiently be engaged in rescue operations. He's referring to those whose lives have wandered from the truth. We are to gently, we are to lovingly influence and guide people back to Christ and to the truth. It is not our job to guilt somebody back. It's not our job to try to convict somebody back. That's God's job, conviction. Satan will do the guilt. It's our job to love people and patiently, gently, and compassionately bring them back. Friends, I want you to know, if you get to a place in your life where you have fallen from the Lord, the last place you should be afraid to go is the church needs to be the first place you go to. Jesus. We're to gently and lovingly guide people back to Christ, back to his truth. Here's what Paul says. Paul says in Galatians chapter, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are, who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. So, Here's how James concludes these five chapters packed instruction on living out genuine faith. 
He says, get ready for the return of Christ. He's coming again. He says, be patient with people and be patient in all circumstances. He says, live with integrity. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Prayerful in all times. In times of trouble, in times of affliction, in times of joy, and in times of sickness. Be prayerful. And he says, bring back those who have wandered from the faith. Bring them back. Love them back into the kingdom of heaven. So let me ask you this question this morning. Do you believe the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective? Do you believe it?